Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on complex variables. In this video we're going to discuss the ideas of winding number and meromorphic functions. Before we do all that though, let's set our foundation by discussing the concept of argument. Say I have a complex number z given by x plus yi, where x and y are real numbers and i is the imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. As we've done in previous videos, we can write this complex number using polar coordinates with x equal to r cosine theta and y equal to r sine theta. r, by the way, is the distance from the origin and theta is the angle relative to the positive x-axis or the positive real axis on the complex plane. If we express x and y using polar coordinates, we can use Euler's formula to write z as r times e to the i theta. We've done this many times so far in our series, so if you've been following along, you should be no stranger to this. The argument of the complex number z, denoted by argz, is then equal to the theta in the polar representation of that complex number. It's the angle that a complex number makes relative to the positive real axis. As a quick example, consider the complex number a equals 1 plus i. We can convert a to polar form. The distance from the origin is just the square root of x squared plus y squared, which is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 2. The angle of a relative to the positive real axis is just the inverse tangent of 1 over 1, which is 45 degrees or pi over 4. Therefore, the argument of a is just pi over 4. Let's now move to the idea of a meromorphic function. A complex function f of z is meromorphic in the domain d if it's holomorphic everywhere in d, that is, if it's complex differentiable in d, except for a finite number of points, which would be the poles of f of z in d. So a meromorphic function is allowed to have a finite number of discontinuities, it just can't be discontinuous over an entire region in d, because that would be infinite discontinuities. Intuitively, you can think of meromorphic functions as lying on the middle of a spectrum of continuity. This left end of the spectrum is for the angry discontinuous functions that are discontinuous over entire regions. This right end is for the nice analytic functions that are continuous and differentiable everywhere. And this middle is occupied by meromorphic functions, which aren't quite continuous everywhere in the domain D, but only have a finite number of discontinuities. So they're not terribly discontinuous either. The next concept I'd like to discuss is the winding number. Say I have a closed contour C in the complex plane that looks something like this. By closed I mean that the contour completely encloses an area. How many times does this contour go around the origin? Well, just from looking at it you can tell it goes around twice. But let's explain why. We'll start over here on this right end of the contour which I'll call Z0. The angle z0 makes with respect to the positive real axis is 0, so we basically start with an argument of 0. Now from z0, we'll go around the curve until we end back up at z0. Once we get to this left end, for instance, our argument will be pi. Once we get back to the right end, our argument will be 2 pi. We keep going until we get back to z0, in which case we'll be 3 pi over here, and then 4 pi once we get back to z0. Throughout this journey, we've gone 720 degrees, or 4 pi radians, around the origin. If we divide this traveled angle by 2 pi, we end up with 2, which is the number of times we've gone around the origin, or in other words, the winding number of c with respect to the origin. Let me go over how we found this winding number. We started at z0, whose argument was 0. We then traveled along the curve until we ended up in our original position. However, our new argument theta naught prime was 4 pi because we had traversed 4 pi radians around the origin to end back up in our original position. If we divide this change in the argument by 2 pi, we get the winding number of c with respect to the origin. Let's find the winding number in a couple more cases. Say I have the same curve again, but I translate it over such that the origin is inside the curve here. The winding number of c in this case around the origin is just 1. Here's why. Let's start at this point again, which I'll call z1 now, with the starting argument of 0. If I travel around this curve to end back up at z1, I'll first get to this left end, which has an argument of pi, then I'll get to this right end, which has an argument of 2 pi since we've gone around once, then I travel around through an angle slightly greater than 2 pi to end up at this point, 
which still has an argument of 2 pi because we're still on the right side of the origin and we haven't gone around it. Finally, I end up back at z1, which again has an argument of 2 pi because still I haven't gone around the origin. So I go from an initial argument of 0 to a final argument of 2 pi. The winding number is therefore 1. Another way to think about it is that I only circle the origin once. I only go around it 360 degrees or 2 pi radians as I traverse this curve. I go around this point twice inside this little loop over here, but I only go around the origin once. Therefore, the change in the argument of z1 when I end up back at z1 is only 2 pi, which makes the winding number equal to 1. Finally, say I have the same curve, but now the origin is completely outside it. The winding number of c around the origin now is 0. To explain, let me start at this point, which I'll call z2, which has a starting argument of 0. If I travel around this curve to end up back at z2, I'll first get to this left end by traveling through an angle slightly greater than 0, but once I get to the left end, I'll end up at a point which has an argument of 0. Then I'll get to this right end by traveling through an angle slightly less than zero, but again the argument of this point at this right end will be zero. I'll repeat the process to end up at z2 and my argument there will still be zero because I still haven't gone around the origin. So I go from an initial argument of zero to a final argument of zero, the winding number is therefore zero. I don't encircle the origin at all, I encircle the points inside the curve, but I do not encircle or wind around the origin. As a result, the winding number of this curve with respect to the origin is zero. The take-home message of all this is that the winding number with respect to a certain point of a curve is the number of times we go around that point as we travel the curve once. It should make sense to you that the winding number must be an integer. You can only go around something an integer number of times. Now, there's an additional concept of the winding number of complex functions instead of the more rudimentary winding number of a curve that we've discussed, and I'll go over that concept now. Suppose I have a function w equals f of z that maps a complex number z to another complex number w. Suppose also that I make up a contour c and that f of z has no poles on this contour and it has no zeros on this contour. If we go around the contour c and evaluate f of z at every point on that contour, I can plot all the resulting values of f of z in the w plane, the complex plane for the variable w. These resulting values will form another closed contour that I'll call capital gamma in the complex plane for w. The reason it's a closed contour is that when we start at some value z0 and go around the closed curve c, we will eventually return to z0 because we're on a closed curve. Now since w is a function of z, w cannot take on multiple values at z0. So if z starts at z0 and w starts at w0, then when z returns to z0 after traversing the closed curve c, w will also return to w0. This means that the curve gamma in the w plane, that's basically the image of c under the function f of z, this curve gamma must also be a closed curve. In addition, the curve gamma will not cross the origin in the w plane. The reason for this is that according to what we specified earlier, f of z has no zeros on the contour c. Therefore, gamma, which is the image of c under the function f of z, does not cross the zero point. It does not cross the origin. Suppose that the polar representation of w is given by rho times e to the i phi, where rho is the distance of the w point from the origin in the w plane, and phi is the angle relative to the positive real axis in the w plane. In that case, the argument of w as we just defined would then just be phi. Now, in order to describe the idea of a winding number of a function, we're going to start at z0 on the curve c, which corresponds to w0 equals f of z0 in the w plane. The argument of this initial point w0 is phi0, let's say. Now, starting from z0, we're going to traverse the entire contour c in the counterclockwise direction, and in addition, we're going to follow the corresponding points w on the image curve gamma. At one stage, while we're traversing the contour c, we will end up back at z0, and at the same time we'll be back at w0 on the contour gamma. Once we've completed the single traversal of the contour c, we obviously end up back at w0. 
However, the argument of W0 isn't necessarily going to be phi0. It's going to be a different angle phi1, which is phi0 plus 2 pi times some integer n. And why do I say it's some integer n and not just phi0 plus 2 pi? It's because even though I go around the contour C just once, that single traversal of C might have corresponded to multiple traversals around the contour gamma. So in going around C once, I could have actually gone around the image of C multiple times. And that's what the n represents. It makes things more general. And this integer multiple n is called the winding number of gamma with respect to the origin in the W plane. It tells us how many times gamma winds or circles around the origin. According to this equation above, the winding number of a closed contour gamma is then 1 over 2 pi times phi 1 minus phi naught. Now phi 1 minus phi naught can also be written as the change in the argument of f of z, or the argument of w, as we make a full traversal of the closed contour c. Therefore, this is the equation which defines our winding number n of a closed contour gamma, which is the image of the closed contour c. Just a couple things to note about the winding number. One is that if gamma winds around the origin in a counterclockwise direction as we wind around uh, the contour C in a counterclockwise direction as well, its winding number will be positive. If gamma winds in a clockwise direction as we go around C in a counterclockwise manner, the winding number will be negative. And if gamma does not encircle the origin at all as we go around the curve C in a counterclockwise manner, if, it do if gamma does not surround the origin, then the winding number will be zero, as I discussed earlier with my example. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.